it's a vampire film with um, some very kitschy visuals and it's very much a period movie so there is definitely you know still the 1960s counterculture fashions are stamped all over this film so it's a bit of an odd beast because uh, Jean Roland's personal preoccupations date back to much earlier than 1960s so the kind of cinema and culture and literature that he references in this movie is much older it dates back to the, the origins of the 21st of the 20th century right you know uh, early uh, silent uh, serials vampires the french uh, serial and at the same time uh, you know due to the time when this movie was uh, conceived it bears the mark of that kind of swinging you know hippie period so um, what exactly is this movie about it's about this castle it's about the visuals of like uh, crumbling stones like that there's different uh, sorts of uh, tombstones at the cemetery so it's like prime Roland when the movie begins there is a lot of that um, typical uh, there is like an outburst of typical uh, Roland cemetery we begin in front of the crypt and immediately we have those kind of bizarre characters and then they are the way they're framed the way they move through through the space is just unmistakably Roland because he obviously casts people who otherwise would never have stood in front of the camera and it's it's a curious sense of detachment which almost gives this film an air of a like a pretentious art house piece which it certainly isn't but neither is shiver of the vampires like a full-blown horror movie there is little or no graphic violence and the actual tension which i think is necessary to pull off a good vampire movie is sorely lacking from this film but there is a lot of kitschy stuff going on there is some uh, creative ways in which uh, some locations are re re repeatedly framed so like there is this castle and you know it it's the principal uh, kind of location but the way Roland kind of plays around with it he always uh, searches out like new outstanding angles to kind of keep it fresh even though the movie is confined more or less to this castle and its uh, environs so um, when it comes to like acting it's also like very representative of the Jean Roland kind of school of directing where he doesn't give a crap I listened to the commentary on, on this um, edition here there is like a, a commentary track from Roland who wasn't that isn't he wasn't in the best of shapes when when he was recording it i think his memory was a little bit sketchy but what what struck me about uh, this commentary was how little he was involved in that movie how little he was invested in the story or like keeping you you know so, sort of engaged which would be like a typical preoccupation of a more traditional filmmaker somebody who's more into hollywood uh, you know three egg structure and all that whereas Roland he keeps referring to oh look at this uh, you know there is two things he basically goes on about it's like the perfect shape of the lead actress who is absolutely motionless and expressionless throughout the movie she pretty much just sleepwalks through the film but he like is very much charmed by her natural you know gifts and her ability to do throbe so that was the one thing he keeps kind of bringing up and another thing he um, really seems to be very pleased with is like the, the colored gels his uh, director of photography brought with him to the location and would employ so there are those I mean this is 1971 this is before Suspiria so there are those bursts of within the same frame something like which I guess people would probably say oh this is like Mario Bava or whatever because there is like red gels and the colder blue electric blue glowing light within the same frame so in the depth of the frame there is the one extreme of the spectrum and out front is like the other so there is a lot of play around that in the nighttime scenes 
sadly this edition here is like a German uh, release uh, the color I don't know what shape the negatives are in these days I really don't know but the colors in this one if they're representative of how badly deteriorated the negative is then well it's truly sad because like reds seem to spill into orange and blues spill into green and everything has a kind of muddy color I mean the film looks as good as is possible for such a kind of homemade movie I know in, 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 in the commentary Roland actually says oh this was a pretty big production company who financed this film but it looks anything but big yeah there is this imposing location there is the battlements and but that's about it everything else looks extremely scarce like uh, the editing is like the, the film is super slow because every frame they shot they try to put I guess to beef up the running time so that there is long passages where literally you could have cut it and the film would have worked so much better but then it would have been a short film so it's definitely a film where they milk the footage to you know get the, to those 90 minutes or whatever so uh, there is not much uh, tension and also what surprised me about this film is it is a Jean Roland film very plainly and clearly but it doesn't have the component which I think marks his favorite his most successful forays into gothic and horror it doesn't have that mournful atmosphere it's one of the more ridiculous films from Jean Roland I can say and intentionally so like a lot of the time with Roland due to his reluctance to direct his cast there is bad performances just flat out bad performances and I say that with love and respect to him as a visionary but he doesn't understand doesn't want to work with you know with the psychology with dynamics of that and in this movie he intentionally like lets the camera roll on some of the hammiest uh, you know absurd performances and in the commentary again he seems quite pleased with uh, how the movie is this is again something which amused me is you know uh, there is the trio of directors like Joe D'Amato, Jess Franco and Roland who are referred to when, when like European sleaze, European sort of uh, erotic cinema gets uh, you know talked about those are the names that tend to come up and I know that Jess Franco would repeatedly say in his interviews like I do not like my own movies some of my movies are less crap than others but none of my movies are any good Whereas, with, when it comes to Roland, if, if this commentary is anything to go by, he seems very, very pleased with how his movie is. Like, so it looks like uh, he's a lot more proud of his achievements compared to his uh, Spanish counterpart, Jess Franco. So that was interesting. And also in the commentary, the references Roland kept bringing up, it was interesting for 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 this is a blatant trash film like i said because it uh, like one of the lead actors was actually a crew member so they just gave crew member like an outfit and put him in front of the camera in the lead part the guy can't act he's he looks like a caricature of like a French art house actor you know if, if you know like the actor Jean Pierre Leo or some of the like if you imagine like a a Frenchman from a 1970s art house movie that guy looks like a caricature of that so if somebody was spoofing like an art house film by Jean Eustache or like Truffaut they would have probably cast that guy so it immediately gives this film um, a kind of a ch it cheapens the movie also because Roland says oh I used one or two performers in 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 this movie which I mean these people were kind of on the sidelines of the French New Wave movement and I think that contributed like that kind of boosted the film whereas in my opinion kind of put it in a very poor light against those more celebrated more cherished uh, achievements so yeah it sounds like I'm dissing uh, several of the vampires it's not my favorite of Roland that's true but visually there are some quite a few actually scenes which are you can tell they were conceived not in haste but with a certain care and this is where I think Roland trumps over Franco and that he 
he doesn't just run out there and zoom in at the first battlement if he kind of lays his eyes on he actually does consider a little bit okay which angle what are we going to do with it which results in a bit more better calibrated you know overall visual ambience but still this movie is very slow moving and as far as Roland's vampire films go it's uh one of the more I don't know there is, a, there is a, just the atmosphere is a bit like I said it's a bit of a spoof which I think nowadays when we have so many horror comedies which riff on on certain you know tropes and take the piss out of the horror cliches this movie doesn't look good because it, it seems to be doing the same thing but being actually from the period back then so it's like a spoof from the time when movies still could have been quite earnest if you see what I mean yeah so there is uh, a good deal of nudity in um, Shiver of the Vampires but to be fair this nudity is also so random uh, Jean Roland mentions that okay it was the financiers who insisted that at certain beats in the story they should be like nudity which it does happen for no reason no you know so it doesn't really uh again doesn't do the movie that many favors <laughs> what about the good things i mean certainly there is the score which i mean love it or hate it i tend to like it even though it's a little bit repetitive and it's again some people could say it's dated but uh, for me it's like by this french short-lived Band called Acanthus, and I think Acanthus is like a flower. If I if I get this right, I'm not sure. Anyway, the band apparently only just did the music for this film, and then they split up. So it works well with the movie. It kind of gives it a boost in what is otherwise a very uh, slow moving story. Like there is almost no story, and as you listen to Roland, you also understand that he is not a storyteller in the traditional sense. He's like somebody who comes up with these vignettes but he doesn't build up any arcs he doesn't he's more his movie is more like a mosaic if you see what i mean it's a bit like uh, you know there is the jess franco film night of the shooting stars christina princess of this and that the one which is kind of like the jess franco adams family film it's a bit like that where there is a beginning and the middle but they don't have anything to do with each other and then the end just comes it doesn't culminate it doesn't really there is no resolution so this movie is a bit like that there is you know characters also do random things for no reason like in this movie this couple of newlyweds uh, go for a stroll in the grounds of this uh, castle and the guy just pulls out a pistol just like that which we haven't seen him with a pistol before in the movie and he just randomly fires I mean, this is something like out of, uh, you know, I don't know. It really didn't work with that character because he doesn't look like a redneck up to that point. He looked like some kind of a strung out bourgeois intellectual dude. Then he just went and shot at some something off screen. Then he basically killed a bird. So, yeah, and this was just to build up to like an image Jean Roland wanted to present us with which is like this white bird with like a splotch of red paint on it poised upon this uh, wooden coffin so that was the idea so they, they put the white bird bleeding bird on this coffin and it was just that kind of imagery that uh, Roland was obsessing with and this was his leading you know the kind of um, um... Oh, whoops sorry that was uh, my doorbell anyway thanks a lot for watching this far i'm alex uh, this is my channel where i mainly cover cinema and i do longer videos about mostly horror movies and genre movies and then i do lots of capsule reviews about just films which i think are really cool good story good acting interesting film identity but are somehow you know not well known so i do a bit of that and uh, occasionally I live stream and a little bit of uh, film collecting is also there so uh, if you like this kind of content so you might want to like this video and uh, subscribe to my youtube channel so you get uh, you know notified when uh, more of my uh, stuff uh, gets uh, you know drops so uh, let's get back to Jean Roland's uh, Shiver of the Vampires so we are back 
to Shiver of the Vampires after I uh, got interrupted there. One of the Castell twins is in Shiver of the Vampires. The Castell twins really got kind of legendary in the movie Lips of Blood, which I also reviewed. I have a bunch of Jean Roulin reviews I did throughout the last few months, so you might want to check those out. Uh, so, to be honest with you, one of the Castell twins was probably one of the stronger actors in this film, and I think they were basically adult performers, so that just kind of gives you an indication what level acting are we talking in this movie. So definitely don't bother checking this movie out if you're into like convincing uh, performances or if you want bloodshed or if you want a lot of vampire action because to be fair vampires uh, they're, they, they're mugging about and they are not really doing much it's it's very theatrical and stagey a lot of their presence so there is some good stuff in terms of visuals like the, the way Roland captures real locations there aren't really sets built but it's all real natural locations and that's uh, you know authentic castle which they dressed up so there is some strong Euro cult ambience achieved through that but it's lessened through uh, sluggish pacing rudimentary editing and like obsession with <laughs> like random nudity so um, you know all these elements make Shiver of the Vampires look bad and make it into a target which it's a movie that's very easy to uh, criticize and it doesn't really make Roland look that good even though he himself seemed to be quite pleased with the way it turned out so um, I would say it's um, not a good you know first Jean Roland movie you might wanna if you're new to this director you might wanna start out with these more accessible movies be it something completely outrageous trash like Zombie Lake or something a bit more uh, personal uh, like his movie uh, The Iron Rose could be an okay one or more you know mainstream ones and crowd-pleasing ones I think are Grapes of Death and uh, The Living Dead Girl are the two movies where it's a bit more you could say just a more casual viewer could probably uh, check those out and get a fair idea of what uh, Roland is all about uh, this edition here comes with uh, all sorts of featurettes and uh, I have to say I do not always have the time or the interest to uh, check those out but there's a short movie on here called Libertà which um, it's it's a short movie which is composed of close-ups of different uh, film promotion ads and posters and lobby cards and things like that and they're basically there is a montage of those including some famous movies like Barbarella, Flashes by, things like that and then there is a voiceover so it's like a kind of a comic book drawn adventure movie so that was a cool uh, little extra I found this movie Shiver of the Vampires isn't really the one I go back to that often because for me it lacks the genuine moody melancholy which I relish in Roland's uh, movies such as Lips of Blood the theme of memory which is I think key to best Roland movies is more or less absent here and the vampire figures are still sort of half formed and would come into their own and become a little bit uh, more um, relatable in his uh, later films you know these early Jean Roland movies they usually have vampire in the title and I do tend to confuse them because yeah there is usually the Castell twins and they usually feature lots of wandering about like the cemeteries one of the cool things I mean I've said a lot of uh, honest things which are not so great about Shiver of the Vampires but one of the great things it comes early on with the opening credits which back when this movie was only on DVD from Redemption I honestly thought that was like black and white film stock and then they printed credits 
in red on top of that in post or something which isn't true apparently as Roland explained that was actually a shot they achieved by shooting in in, in color and uh, it just looks because there is just nothing colorful in the frame because there's it's like a backlit shot with those uh, amazing large uh, sort of stone crucifixes uh, you know those this kind of tombstones against the fog it just looks amazing set to that uh, prog rock music so it really promises an epic crazy lost gem of a movie which sadly never quite materializes but it's still a jolting beautiful uh, beginning the interesting thing about this opening shot was again something I gathered from the commentary was it wasn't a fog machine they put I thought always thought well they purposely whacked the fog machine and put the light behind it so that they get this beautiful you know fog bound cemetery but no apparently there was some kind of vapor emanating from somewhere at the cemetery and they just grabbed that shot at random which again could be you know cinema is a weird thing you never can quite pre-plan everything and this movie although some of the visuals seem like they are um, to a good degree uh, constructed and preconceived but there is a lot of um, also quite random things and uh, which make the movie look quite sort of rough around the edges which I think it's also refreshing uh, today when I think a lot of there is a lot of younger filmmakers now who love horror and want to make and make their own digital horror films and they tend to obsess about like using drones and gimbals and having those fluid shots and trying to be as Kubrick like symmetrical and you know I don't know sharp and well framed and high resolution as possible and they lose sight that the film's essence doesn't always uh, sort of require perfection like for somebody like Kubrick he had to have perfection because that was part of his identity but there are many other directors where there is other concerns there is filmmakers like Fassbender the guy made lots of movies he was a contemporary of Kubrick's and there is lots of cheap zoom shots uh, very boring steady shots and blurry shots in his films and yet he has a, like a body of work which is insane and explores very personal themes and is an author in his own right this is just one filmmaker I could bring up even in Scorsese if you like like an uh, if you see like an early movie from Scorsese like Mean Streets oh my god there are so many grubby shots grabbed off the street and something you know which is definitely you can tell oh my god this is you know very much like grungy cinema very day. early Abel Ferrara movies even now there is also kind of young filmmakers who do not give a crap thank god about you know technical perfection so all I'm saying is in my opinion just getting perfect framing dead on shots does not still guarantee that you will you know make a movie which has a soul or which has some kind of personality because there are lots of movies now where technical merits are at least average and adequate but the movie just doesn't breathe because the, you know obviously the crew and everybody were busy getting the sound clean sound and well composed shots and they completely forgot to get the viewer emoting and no this movie doesn't really get you emoting but it does offer you some giggles in how pathetic inadequate the performances are and how self-indulgent some of the uh, you know some of the scenes are which go on forever some of the jokes are intentional some of them are perhaps it's just through the sheer ineptitude Jean Roland is like one of the worst people to uh, comment his own films because he the merits he extols you know the things he rhapsodizes about in his films are very self-evident to anybody who likes his films and then the more subtle things he doesn't actually touch upon and, and he seems also a little bit uh, kind of craving legitimacy and he does it by dragging in parallels and references to material and other creative works which I don't think anybody of his true fans really cares about so obviously it's interesting that he was um, looking to uh, 
kind of reaffirm his own uh, sense of self-worth in that way and at the same time he sort of um, failed uh, to um, be proud of the things he was really good at at being himself and doing the kind of crazy things only he could have done and uh, Shiver of the Vampires from 1971 is not entirely successful but has its share of charm and some cool visuals so that's it thanks for watching bye bye